Hey everyone, welcome to Crest TV. We are out on location at Microsoft's Hive. I am, uh, as the Americans would say, super excited, which from an, an English person uh, is sort of mildly interested. Um, but no, it's, it is awesome, this place. We've done a tour. I maybe take you behind the scenes with a camera a little bit later on. But I've grabbed Greg Barabalt, who is product owner for Teams Rooms. He's given me a cool tour, and we're gonna talk to you about some of the cool features that we've uh, seen in Teams, uh, at Teams Rooms over the last uh, couple of weeks. So Greg, AI co Copilot. Copilot is the word of the day. Um, five times a day. Yes, five times a day. I've got the stickers actually to go on my case. Yeah. Um, talk to the viewers about what it's going to mean to Teams Rooms. We've heard about it on the desktop and I can go in there and start you know, questioning it. How's it going to work in a room? What's Copilot going to do to my Teams Room systems? Well, so Copilot is a highly personalized uh, output. After, you know, think of a meeting that goes on, you have a set of action items and notes and follow up items. What I want at the end of that meeting is a personalized output that tells me what I need to follow up on. And the challenge when you get into a conference room is everybody is sort of represented as the room system. Yeah. It's the conference room, it's room whatever, A's, yeah, uh, that has created all of the audio. So what we're building now is the ability to allow the room system to really activate Copilot in a deeply personalized way. So when I walk into the room, it knows who I am. When I sit down, I'm, I'm labeled in my video. I show up in the roster, but more importantly, when I speak, my words are attributed to me, mm -hmm. my identity in the, in the transcript, and then Copilot reasons over that transcript in a way that uh, can create an output that says, hey, Greg asked uh, you know, Neil to follow up on this item, yeah. even if I have nothing personal like a phone or a laptop in the room with me. How does it know it's you, though? And, and, I, and I know the answer, but again, I want to make sure that everyone out there knows. Because again, we're talking about a, a single meeting room space. Greg has suddenly, or I come in, I'm here in the Hive. How does the Hive know Neil? Because right. I don't work for Microsoft and, and I'm in that room. How does it know? Well, so the, the, the recognition process starts with enrollment. Right. So you enroll your voice. You do that in the Teams client at your own, you know, on your own time. It takes just a couple seconds, really. You read it. Read it a couple of sentences, yeah. yeah. And now, now Teams knows your voice. Um, any room that you walk into, then within your own tenant, um, will recognize your voice if you're invited to a meeting, and the room is also involved in that same meeting. Right. So if I just walk into a random room and start talking, it's not going to know who I am. That that's a good privacy yeah. uh, feature there. Um, but if I'm invited to the meeting, the room's invited to the meeting. Uh, or we nudge the room into the meeting or do a BYOM, we call it, right? Kind of uh, proximity join. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly that room can recognize my voice when I speak, uh, just matching me against um, my voice profile. Profile is kept in the cloud. Data is kept in the tenant's uh, uh, secure storage. Um, and yeah, so the, it, you know, it's great for rooms. What we started to find was people were... Um, you know, they weren't necessarily getting a lot out of that when they do the enrollment. So now we uh, have also this week introduced uh, personalized noise suppression, voice isolation, yep. where on my own team's desktop, wherever I happen to be, a loud environment, a coffee shop, maybe at my own desk with my kids running around, um, the, the filtering will be uh, to take everything else out, including other human voices except for mine. Wow. And we leverage that same uh, enrollment data to do that. So you get a lot of benefit now from enrolling your voice and your face into the system. So where, and I won't put you on the spot there because obviously this is public, so no roadmap, but I'm just, again, I was thinking in my head as you were saying that, where could this go? Could we do things like real-time translation with like uh, different languages and things like that? I mean, again, are you thinking about these ideas out there? And, and again, what's what could be next for this, this audio oh, piece? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So live transcript, live captions, translated in real time, um, there's a lot, you know, you can even carry that uh, into many different dimensions. I can see Mesh doing sort of voice, uh, you know, you can have different avatars, but you can have different voices maybe as well. <laughs> Darth Vader or, yeah, uh, yeah. One, yeah. Like the witness protection, yeah. I can maybe change my face and my voice. Yeah, nobody knows I'm there. The incognito feature yeah. mode. Yeah, I like it. So I guess you, you obviously, this is like version one and two, you're going to really take this this enrollment piece once you've done that, then the features will layer up because it's in the cloud, isn't it? This is not yeah. happening on some processor in the room. This is being all uplifted into the cloud and all the heavy lifting and processing is done in Azure and on the, on the Microsoft Cloud. There's a little bit of both, right? So you have uh, the voice matching. Yes, happens only in the cloud uh, and voice data uh, is saved there and then the voice stream from the room comes up and we recognize. Um, when we built this, you know, this was actually over a year old now, um, 
we actually built it for a different purpose. This was pre-Copilot. Uh, we actually, I'll say we got a little lucky uh, that Copilot's taken off as it has. Um, we first built this for inclusive meeting features. We wanted to, um, for face enrollment mm -hmm. and for voice enrollment, no people are in the room. People feel really disconnected now when they meet in a conference room and there's one big camera in a bad location that's getting the whole table and people feel like they're not individually seen and heard. So we envisioned this uh, face and voice recognition so that people really know you're there and you feel individually connected to the meeting. So uh, the, the voice recognition, yes, happens in the cloud. The face part of that, um, the cameras are specially equipped to give us a, a dedicated feed that we can then match. The matching and the enrollment data, biometric data, of course stays in the cloud um, under you know, Microsoft's uh, control and customer control. But uh, it does require a little bit of special secret sauce on the camera uh, to activate that. Okay. So we talked about audio. The other big thing is Intel, Intelli, you're going to call it Intella because I've learned that this week, um, although it should be called Intel I uh, framing Intel I frame. properly. Um, yes. So again, Intelli framing, I framing, our framing. Um, talk to us about that and then we'll then segue nicely into then adding more cameras into the room yeah, after that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so Inteliframe, uh, for us, Intelli frame <laughs> is a way of, uh, think about the receiving client now. So this is me at home, I'm on my big desktop screen. I want to see all those faces in the room individually. So IntelliFrame, IntelliFrame, lets me uh, have a layout that really puts each face at the table in a unique video feed, um, actually as a separate video feed, so I can even organize them a little bit differently on my client, uh, and gives everybody a, a you know, special presence on the meeting stage, like you were used to when you had that camera mm. 18 inches away from your nose. Um, now you get that same experience from the room. And you can spotlight, I guess, and you can, you know, if you want to choose. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, roadmap. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you'll be able to spotlight uh, down the road. Okay. Um, but spotlighting really then requires that the camera in the room never loses sight of that one person. Right. Oh, and yeah, today so we're very active so speaker. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, so that'll come. Uh, yeah, a little roadmap there. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to create this uh, kind of beautiful face first uh, stage. Of course, not every camera can do that today, uh, so we introduced it in the cloud as well. So even you know, without upgrading the camera in the room, uh, we can still process that, kind of decode, find the faces, zoom in, uh, make that beautiful in the cloud for the legacy rooms that have just one camera. But we love these rooms that have multiple cameras. So no matter what you do with AI or cloud decoding and processing, people face different directions in the room. And there's really just no good way to get every face clearly straight visible uh, from one camera that's up at the front. I, I always say cameras can't see around corners. That's, that's the problem. See around corner or through other people. Yeah. So yeah, so we're finding uh, a lot more customer interest in cameras that are positioned around the room in a way that give a really nice uh, view of each person's face, regardless of where they're looking, who's sitting next to them. And uh, yeah, it's actually been uh, Looked at very, very favorably here. Microsoft, we have many rooms, our boardroom, we have some executive briefing rooms that have it. Uh, we saw one here at the Hive. Yeah. Um, so we're really loving this experience. Yeah, and I guess the, the, the other thing that's really great for is where you've got different angles, so like classrooms, auditoriums, where you want a camera on the lectern or the stage, but then you also want a camera on the audience or the, the, the people in the training room. So again, I have a question, you see the person asking the question, and you've got the lecturers then talking at the front, so the ability to then have those multiple views from yeah. different rooms. Yeah, super important. Or uh, rooms that tend to, like those with the lectern, people tend to pace. Mm. You know, we're not moving much here, right. but it's pretty common for people to walk around and to have a camera that can track uh, the, the presenter and also capture the audience or um, even not voice based, just capturing the reaction of other people at the table. Visual cues are really important in a meeting. Yeah. And we have a lot of people that will kind of nod without saying a word. And it's important for the remote audience to be able to see that. That conveys a lot of information. Um, and so having that, you know, nice tight view of each face is just invaluable. Now, there's one question I do want to ask you, uh, and we had a, a bit of a chat, uh, we've, we've chatted offline, so I've got loads of cool stuff up here that you're not allowed to know about, but um, Interop, we talked about it briefly, this idea of, you know, bring your own device, you know, is, is Interop going via BYD, is Interop going via the direct guest join, what's your view around Interop and where's it going to go? 
I think the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> it's going in, in a lot of different directions at the same time. It's choice, given that some people will maybe want to use a USB and, and use their own device. Some people may want that Absolutely. direct guest join. Yeah, choice is super important. Um, fidelity of the experience is super important. And I'd say it's a lot driven by um, how frequently you need to, to do that interoperable meeting uh, joining. Just that one Friday afternoon call with that one supplier, or is right. it then more you than do that. something differently than if it's your everyday occurrence? Every other meeting uh, is on a different provider. So we want to fully embrace both. Um, so at Ignite, of course, this week, we talked about BYOD rooms mm -hmm. and showed how you can come into any space, plug in your laptop, and have a great in-room experience. There's another part of that uh, that I think is super important, which is um, IT teams don't tend to have deep insights in the rooms that are not well equipped with a, a full MTR and a, a device that they can monitor and manage. So BYOD spaces tend to be a little bit off the radar um, by allowing the laptops to kind of inform uh, that these are BYOD spaces and signal that back to the management tools. We can inform IT about where the next great MTR space might be. So you have rooms that are heavily utilized, multiple people, but it's still one person that's plugging in the laptop, um, that's a great candidate to upgrade to an MTR. So, so how does it know? This is a question for me, actually, because I saw the um, shared display mode that, uh, that was demoed. Yeah. How does it know? What's the, because again, my PC at home, I've got multiple displays connected up to it. How does it know, okay, Neil's now in a meeting room with his laptop versus Neil's at his desk with a, a docking station? Well, that's the secret sauce. Ah. We'll talk about that soon. Okay, cool. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Roadmap again. We won't go there. Okay, so but, but BYD is obviously a focus, and that, that fact of giving data and awareness and visibility to the IT team so they can then make those choices of, okay, right. that room we should maybe upgrade and give them a full MTR experience. That room, it's a bit dusty. No one really goes in there. We'll leave that as BYD, yeah, and everything's sure. good. And then once it is an MTR room, to your point, how does that room stay interoperable? Um, Direct guest join is actually a great solution for that. Mm -hmm. Um, where customers can one touch join just as easy as a Teams meeting can join other providers as well. Um, that was a great innovation that we brought there. Um, we're looking at how to expand that, improve it, kind of uh, evolve that ecosystem. Um, it's become such a critical thing for customers that are maybe migrating to Teams, customers that have their customers that aren't on Teams that they need to talk to all the time. Uh, so a lot of good use cases around interop, really core uh, part of the strategy for us. Very cool. Anything else that we can cover without covering an NDA with anybody? Yeah. Can you give us any, any little secret tips? Uh, um, Put you on the spot here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I, I would take a close look at, I, I, we talked about IntelliFrame. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about IntelliFrame. I think it's, it, it was a great way to solve for meeting equity, mm -hmm. making people really have that great feeling in the room uh, that they're seeing. And then also the, the new uh, co-pilot activation is just, you know, it's going to be incredible. Any, any new room architects, uh, archetypes coming? We are. We continue to grow that set. Um, so we have multiple now that we call signature rooms and standard rooms. Um, we're looking at growing those to be larger spaces, looking at boardroom, uh, extra large space, even divisible multi-purpose rooms uh, that you might reconfigure. So we'll, we'll continue to expand that and make them even better, maybe even get to autograph rooms. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe. I like the sound of that, an autograph room. Well, you heard it here first, or second or third, actually. <laughs> But there's a, there's a lot more stuff coming in that space. And again, you're giving those blueprints and those archetypes for customers to then go and deploy. And they get really great best practice because you test, again, you're testing them here. You're making these up. Again, we've seen some of the rooms here. It's really cool what you're doing here. We do. We test them all here. Um, we give a, a really a recipe for recreating that room. And for us, it's like many customers will build out demo rooms and kick the tires, try it out. Um, the archetypes are there to help customers get to scale. Once I've tried one or two rooms, I know I like Teams rooms. Now I want to deploy it in 100 rooms, 1,000 rooms. How do I do that in a repeatable way? Uh, the Hive and the archetypes are a great way to understand the physical aspects. What hardware do I put in? And then the, the stuff that we talked about this week with Autopilot and uh, one-time passcode make the actual deployment and provisioning turnkey, one step, done remotely, just really streamlining that deployment process. Greg, thank you ever so much for joining us. Loads of cool stuff and a few little secrets uh, uh, sprinkled in there as well. Uh, so uh, hopefully we won't get too much trouble. Uh, thank you all for joining. Make sure you ring the bell, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Tell your friends that Crest TV is a place to be. And we'll get Greg back on soon when he can tell us some more about that secret source that we're not allowed to talk about. But we'll catch you on the next one.